Hello and welcome to this Meet the Miniaturist live stream. As folks join, please say hello in the chat box. The chat box will be open throughout for questions. Um, somebody say hello just to tell me that it's working. Um, but welcome on this Sunday. Uh, thank you for joining. Oh, perfect. Hi, Kathy. Great to see you. And Emily and Laura. Yay. Great to see you. I'm going to go ahead and just start and give you a little bit of rundown of what's going on in my neck of the woods before we introduce our wonderful panelists um, to talk about this wonderful topic of storytelling in miniatures. So thank you for joining. If you don't know about me, I'm Darren Scala from D. Thomas Miniatures. I am unapologetic about my love of miniatures and I promote them every chance I get, which is what this is really all about. But I also sell miniatures. So if you go and um, check out my eBay website, eBay selling site, uh, there's links in the chat box for you to check out what I have listed right now on my estate sales. And I also just started a new miniversity, the D. Thomas Miniversity program, which is all about just teaching things about miniatures. So check that out. My next miniversity course is going to be led by Ann Pennypacker. She is a mini tools enthusiast, and uh, she's going to take us through some of her, the, the most uh, uh, asked about tools in the miniature in, in within miniatures. Um, so that's going to be on Sunday, March 24th, one week from today at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So there's a link there to go ahead and register and join that. Hi there. Hey, Kingston, Jamaica. Good to see you. And I'm also going to pop in there my links to my social media. You can check out some of my previous Meet the Miniaturists uh, broadcasts and check those out. Um, but let's get right to it today. We're going to talk about um, the uh, the topic of storytelling within miniatures. And I want to thank my guests today, um, Amanda Kelly from Panda Miniatures, Lauren Delaney. She's also known as Lady Delaney and Lauren Dodge from a Southern Gothic dollhouse. She's out in San Francisco. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining. I am so appreciative that you're here today to talk about this topic. You know, it's been on my mind for a long time that um, there is this emergence of storytelling in miniatures, just helping to, to bring it to a whole new place. And I can't think of three more talented ladies than the three of you who have been doing this in the miniatures world for, for a while now and really making your mark within that realm of telling stories with each of the miniatures you make. And I was, I was, you know, I'm just struck by how different each of you work within those realms. Um, and you're each accomplished, uh, you know, you're each very accomplished in your own right. And I'm just so happy that you're here and you're here to talk about um, how you work within storytelling. So um, why don't we start and uh, do a little introduction. I'll have each of you uh, talk a little bit about yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do and how you incorporate storytelling into the miniatures that you make. Let's start with you, Amanda, if you don't mind. And, and I think one of the keys to miniatures within your world is all about bringing in your own personal stories behind the, the miniatures. And then, so tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about your backstory in, in, as a creative artist. Sure. Uh, thank you, Darian, and um, both Lawrence. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, uh, I have been making miniatures for about eight years now um, in the professional space. Um, I am currently in my MFA program, of um, so a Master's of Fine Art um, in Sculpture. It's my last semester. Yay. I'm very happy to have my show in like three weeks, and then I'm done. Wow. Um, <laughs> So um, really, I have always been interested in storytelling through my miniatures. You know, when I started making miniatures, um, it was at a time where there weren't a lot of modern miniatures, not a lot of unique, um, more adult miniatures on the market. So I started making things that were in my own life, like, you know, um, just things that you wouldn't normally see um, or haven't seen. In the, mini in the dollhouse and miniature community. Um, and then when I uh, started my MFA program, I, um, you know, writing a thesis, creating a thesis exhibition, creating thesis works, um, you're really all about the storytelling. Like you have to tell a story. That's the whole point of, you know, the final exhibition is to tell this, you know, ask a question, create a problem and solve that problem with, with the pieces that you make. So um, yeah. I really got interested in, um, uh, researching compulsive hoarding. So uh, my first piece that I ever made that was really the foundation piece of my entire thesis was the hoarder's porch. <laughs> um, I made that in, in, well, I started it actually 
years prior. It was actually um, originally a kit from um, the miniature club I was a part of in New York City. And I definitely <laughs> changed that kit quite a bit um, when I created the Hoarder's Porch. But, um, you know, I started thinking about um, compulsive hoarding and what that means like in my personal life and my experiences with it. Um, so I, yeah, I, I started with the Hoarder's Porch and then I was like, let me see if I can actually make this like a series. So mm -hmm. I started really, I just, honestly, what I start with is just writing down um, my thoughts, like notes, um, what kind of scene I want to create. I really wanted to show um, kind of the spectrum of compulsive hoarding because it, it doesn't just, you know, you think of like the show hoarders or something mm -hmm. um, where, you know, it's, it's it's a lot of, <laughs> you know, dirt and grime and things, but hoarding doesn't always necessarily have to show that. Um, I have a piece that is about shopping addiction, mm -hmm. um, you know, from another personal experience of mine from a friend of a friend who, who had that um, and they just hoard clothes. So, um, you know, my journey into miniatures has definitely evolved over the years. <laughs> um, but, you know, this this body of work that I created um, around my thesis topic has really, um, it's kind of like what I love doing and what I love making. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so let me, let me just close this. Why don't we talk to you, Lauren L. Delaney? Um, tell us a little bit about your um, involvement in miniatures and how you bring storytelling into your world. I feel like yours is a little more community based. Is, is does that sound right? Huh, that's interesting. I so I guess um, I got my start. My grandpa made dollhouses for us, so it, it started. You know, it was really a family thing. Um, and my sister and I would, you know, cut boxes apart and magazine articles and hang the pictures you know and cut up old towels and turn them into rugs and things like that and then um i think my love of it as an adult and i think you know its relationship for me to storytelling really grew out of a love of theater uh -huh. and theatrical illusion and so i um my master's program was in costume design and it was cool because though it was primarily focused on you know costume and character design we also did intensives in lighting design and set design um, and, you know, theater designers still, uh, production designers will build these set models where they'll, you know, shrink the, the stage down to scale and they will um, have the little pieces that you can move around for the different acts and it gives you a sense proportionally of how moments in the action relate to each other. and. Um, so definitely for me, it comes out of, you know, a love of storytelling on stage in a dollhouse. It's really, it's kind of like a miniature stage, yeah. basically. Um, yeah. I, the other thing I really love, you know, that theater does, and we willingly go into it for the fun of this, but, you know, a magician or a theatrical designer, they, if they're good at what they do, they're, they're good at lying to their audience. Uh -huh. And what I mean is, you know, that thick, beautiful antique tome on the stage, that old book, it's not pages, it's maybe, you know, the pages maybe are corduroy. Like it's its not what you think it is. The materials that are employed to create the illusion are not necessarily maybe intuitive to someone who, you know, doesn't work in these different materials like we do, or, you know, take such daily joy in um, finding garbage and figuring out what you can transform it into. So I really love that aspect with theater design. And I and I, I have a couple stories from when I was studying theater design. I remember going to a, a party at one of our, um, one of our, our stage designers homes, and he had these big set pieces from when he had done The Sound of Music. They had these big, you know, ornate, carved, granite looking, these beautiful things that are worthy of Captain Von Trapp's Mansion oh, in Austria, yes. and they're sculpted from kitty litter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, clean kitty litter, but yeah. But like, I just love that. You know, I love that sleight of hand, sort of with miniatures, and um, yeah. and theater. You know, it is a great orbit around which community moves, and is built. Uh, a lot of my New Orleans um, associates are involved in the theater community, and I think there's definitely. Yeah. Um, parallels, but also that wonderful sense of community that, that comes out of working yeah. on a shared enterprise and sharing kind of quirky interests, you know, um, that maybe the rest of the world doesn't understand or share. Yeah. I, I also, I love how you, what, what brought me to community was some of your programs where you invite the community to discover and find. 
And so talk a little bit about that program where you, um, with the, with the gravestones. Yeah. So I, um, one of my, one of the chapters of my New Orleans life, I worked at this amazing escape room called Escape My Room. And, um, and I, I helped to, you know, create the puzzles and the archival documents, you know, you take a hotel, old hotel letterhead and you put secrets, you know, somehow encode secrets into it. And out of that, um, I, you know, I had that great stint there and then I left to work on some of my own projects, but I, I started creating these mystery yeah. series where they, I've played with the medium, but like the haunted dollhouse, you get a box of clues and you assemble them. You're basically recreating a miniature crime scene and you're sifting through, you know, diary pages. And then um, Tiny Tombs is a walking tour, a free walking tour of New Orleans, where there are these little New Orleans style mausoleums. Our, fa our architecture, our cemetery architecture is super famous. And there are these miniature mausoleums in businesses. And so you go out and you you find them and each one has a different occupant. So you could learn you know, the story of the person who's spending their eternity in the tomb. Um, but yeah, it's a great way to discover some of the cool yeah. of the interact historical sites. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That's an awesome introduction. Lauren Dodge, how are you today? I'm so good. How are you today? Good. So we have talked before, and I'm you just have. amazed at where you've brought your whole world and the following that you've been able to, you know, tap into. Um, I kind spooky of girls, spooky girls, spooky boys. Spooky. Yeah, you've taken spooky <laughs> yeah. to a whole new place. And that's exactly what I was yeah. gonna say. Talk a little bit about that, what your background is for people who might not know who you are. And, and how you got involved in this, in, in in telling stories through your miniatures. And also talk a little bit about how you incorporate, how you incorporate others to help you with that, in that effort. Yeah, absolutely. First, I wanna say, it's so nice to meet you, Amanda and Lauren. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, been, I've been admiring your work from afar. And I have to say like, uh, Lauren, I she's the one who actually got me into miniatures. <gasps> Get so, uh, I mean, before, like, before COVID, it was, like, right before COVID, I'm, I'm really into, like, curio and kind of weird stuff, and I was, it's like, I could really, like, I want, I want to put more curio in my cabinet, and I found her little curio cabinet kit, and I was like, oh, what? <laughs> and I've never done miniatures, like, that looks like so much fun, and so I got her stuff. Oh, that's awesome. And, like, the way that she packaged it and like she included like color theory and like it was so like <laughs> it was so eye-opening it was a whole world i didn't know about yeah um, i called her my miniature godmother because like she's like, <laughs> attracted me to the space so uh, like it's such an honor to be in your guys uh, presence i really i adore your art and oh. I, you're always an inspiration that's um, lovely. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so it all started really, it li literally started from that. And, um, Lauren and I, actually, I think we have a lot in common cause I also come from a theater background ah. and I studied set design and I loved like whenever I'm watching a movie, I'm, I'm mostly looking at the production, right? Like I'm mostly looking at the sets and like, you're so right. Like how you direct audiences, um, I with just lighting or just the design, um, with, without any like characters or actors on the set is. I think it's a really interesting challenge and it's one that's also really fun for like escape rooms that I also enjoy um, doing. So um, when I started, I'm like, oh, my stuff is on the screen. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Sorry. So I, I'm like really into Halloween and I've been kind of like, I didn't really follow. Um, I ended up doing something completely different than set design, but I still really enjoyed the, like designing uh, my Halloween parties like to a really obnoxious <laughs> degree. <laughs> And um, when COVID hit, I couldn't really do those anymore. And so I was like, well, how can I continue this, you know, interest of mine and also not pour so much money into it only to take it down the next day. And I think um, right. making a, a spooky dollhouse was the inspiration. Um, but it has evolved into something entirely different. You know, I, I chose Southern Gothic because um, I was like, you really honestly, the best thing to do if you if you don't know the direction that you want to take something, just put a mark on the page, you know, mm. just like put a mark on the page. Just give yourself just bring your your choices down a little bit so it doesn't feel so overwhelming and then you can really just roll with with anything that you put down honestly and and with southern gothic i had so many assumptions about it mm. um, and as i started sharing my work on the internet and like really engaging with people and and rather than you know just making aesthetics which is what i was expecting to do it's like i'm just gonna make a spooky little southern gothic dollhouse um, I start. I started really uncovering that it's it's not really fair to like paint such a stereotypical picture about something that's so nuanced, right? As the American South. So now I've just gotten really, really deep, and I've, I've learned so much. Um, 
you know, now so I'm starting to, to engage folks in conversation whose like family is 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 from there. I'm really interested in like the Choctaw Nation at the moment oh. um, and the Gullah Geechee people and how they are connected to um, the mostly Mississippi, the land. Um, and this story, like I've, I've noticed that miniatures are really a really great tool to tell stories, but they're also a really great mm. tool to write stories. So if you're like, you know, I want to I want to create um, I want to create a relationship between these two characters, um, creating a room or creating a table that they might sit or like have a game like allows you to ask so many questions about their dynamic. Like what kind of game would they, they be playing? Would it be checkers? Would it be chess? Yeah. Would it be, you know, would one of the chairs be flipped over? Was there, you know, a, an argument? Um, like with Lady Delaney's um, curio, what would they want to show on their curio cabinet? What would they want people to know about them or think about them? And these are all questions you can really dig into with miniatures. I really love it. That, that Thank you for that. You know, that was going to be one of my questions to you guys. What comes first, the miniature or the story? And it sounds like it could be a combination of both. I mean... Or do you see an object and you think, okay, I want to make that and build a story around it? How, how does that process work for you guys? Does somebody want to take that? <laughs> I, I can continue a little bit, but I would yeah. love to hear what, how, what you guys do. So um, it, it is definitely both. So I have, I, I, I do consider myself a miniaturist, probably not to the degree as Amanda. I feel like Amanda, like I've watched you make um like little water bottles like with that back i'm just like oh my god she makes literally everything everything you see amanda makes <laughs> i i make some i buy some i commission some so i feel yeah. like i'm more of like a production designer right um and so uh, there are, i have like um I, uh, some of my supporters have been so sweet and they send me like vintage miniatures that i that i'll keep and so sometimes i'll take these vintage miniatures and i'll kind of put them like all right here's some toys i'll put them in front of me i'm like okay so i have a clown i have a jack-in-the-box and i have a doll what's going on with this how can i make yeah. this doll important on this shelf and yeah. then I can write a story from that yeah. um and then if i need any other supporting things that i just don't have then i'll make them and like add yeah. it to the so you just kind of like okay yeah i mean i think i feel like you know the the kinds of work you guys are doing is is really helping to elevate the art of miniature. Um, the fact that you have these stories being told through your work is impacting people. It's changing, potentially changing lives. I mean, tell me a little bit about the feedback you might get. Amanda, what kind of feedback do you get from people when they see your work? And does that align yeah. with what you want them to feel when you're making it? Yeah, I was actually going to comment about that because I just posted a video about one of my recent works that I completed and it's a kitchen scene. It's hoarded, of course. Um, and I got, I think, over a thousand comments and a lot of them, I would say maybe like, uh, maybe like 60% of them were just like, I, this is the house I grew up in, <laughs> you know, so it was like a lot of people who relate to the work that I'm doing and that's why I'm making it is. Yeah um to to not only educate about you yeah. know the the disorder but also um you know show people that you know you can use miniatures yeah. you don't have to paint you don't have to sculpt technically i mean miniatures are kind of like sculpting but yeah. <laughs> um you know and for me as a uh, someone who has an art degree i started with painting i was an oil painter for a long time um and painting never it just never was the right medium, I don't think, for me, for explaining, like, my feelings and my stories. So miniatures, um, just like Lauren was saying, you know, it's, like, all about the details. It's, like, mm -hmm. you know, the coffee ring on the table, you know, the, the, you know, the, the empty, you know, basket or something left on a doorstep, you know, something like that, where it's, like, you can get the story of, like, the human element from the objects that you're seeing instead of having figures, because I don't think any of us have figures in our work, right, right. Um, not to it like an extent of like miniature doll. Yeah, yeah. Dolls or anything. I mean, it, um, it, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh no. So say, we kind of you? kind of flow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's interesting. You talk about how, you know, you started making little water bottles and now look at where you are. <laughs> and I wanted to ask maybe maybe um, Lauren L. Delaney, um, talk a little bit about your evolution. How, you know, think back when you first started making miniatures and where you are now. How has that evolved? Um, and has it evolved to incorporate storytelling? 
Yeah, so um, the very first miniatures I ever made were um, for my grandparents, for my grandma's dollhouse. So it was like a replica of my grandma's wedding dress, you know, little family portraits. And so when I launched my Etsy shop in 2009, my um, miniatures, they tended more to the vanilla end of the spectrum. Uh, like, it was, it, it, you know, it felt like what was safe and it felt like, okay, yeah. what is there a market for? I think I was definitely, you know, thinking in terms of like, I, my mind hadn't been freed from like what a doll, you know, the stereotype of like what a dollhouse could be. So it was like little yeah. rag rugs and little knitting, you know, sewing projects with balls of yarn, all beautiful, perfectly valid details for a scene. Yeah. But I remember, um, I remember, you know, maybe doing the first tiny butterfly collection or doing the first little cabinet of curiosity. And it was such an, there, it was it just, it didn't exist on the market. You know, there wasn't something like, you know, what, um, it's kind of, for me, it was kind of a lark. And it was like, well, I don't know if anyone is gonna buy this, but it's fun to make it. And I think one of the real re revelations, you know, and I wonder if this has been the case with Amanda and Lauren is like, when you lean into your weird, you realize that you're not alone, that there are lots of other weirdos out there who want to jump on that train with you. So, you know, what you might think is super fringy and like who wants a dinosaur skull in their dollhouse? If you want it, there are probably a good number of other people who yeah. would be just about seeing it too. So I think that's been super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. to realize you know that you can kind of you can get you don't have to you don't have to stay in the lane so to speak see you what you're calling weird i'm calling innovative oh in listen sense, always in, a compliment <laughs> in the sense that it is changing the dynamic it's changing the perception and however you get there you, you know you're saying it's weird that's fine i call it innovation because it is moving the this little world that we love so much and i think the three of you exemplify that moving this little world um, so that's interesting that you say, you know, you started out in this safe, safe place and you started being kind of, kind of yourself. I mean, is that what, it, what I'm hearing? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and like, I understand I am living in a city of delightful weirdos. So when yeah. I say weird or weirdo, like that is the highest form of compliment that I can pay. For. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, we're all playing in this world of dollhouse miniatures and we're already in a pigeonhole as, as weirdos and you know, oh, yeah, yeah, and all yeah, that. So yeah. we might as well just be <laughs> just go all in out all out. Yeah. But I mean I yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Lauren, Dodge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's like it's like, yeah, actually we did we have really found found our, our weirdo niche and I so yeah. my thing was like I have people still sending me their baby teeth because I put them in the house, right? And so speaking yes. of weird. Um, you know, I've got a little chandelier of baby teeth and I have teeth that's like in some of the floor. Um, yeah. A lot of it was inspired by, I don't, I never want to like ruin the story, but a lot, so a lot of my stuff is inspired by Southern Gothic stories or, or singers. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, uh, my own curio cabinet of stories, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the teeth thing has been really, it, it's been an interesting test. I had no idea what, how people would take it or if. They would be interested in sending me teeth, but I get messages all the time. Are you still taking teeth? <laughs> Are you still taking weird family secrets? Yeah. I'm like, all the time. Yeah. All the time. I love, that. I love how you bring the, the world into your world and you incorporate it. Because I think at the end of the day, that's also what miniatures are all about. You know, the diorama and people who create these memory yeah. boxes. It's all about, you know, from a, from a hobbyist level, it's about creating those little memories and those stories that may be just perfectly personal to each of themselves. Um, but I want to talk about um, how I want to talk about how your work has impacted the traditional miniatures world, um, how it has perhaps elevated it, um, brought more people in that might not have seen miniatures the same way before. Talk a little bit about the impact you feel like you might have made on 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 people who may not have ever just you know thought about this world. <laughs> I think. Um... I guess I'll just go. <laughs> We're yeah, going like please. in a circle. Yes. Anyway. Um, and so when I first started with miniatures, I went to my first miniature show. Actually, I think Lady Delaney was there and I bought these. Her, her whole like display was incredible. Yes. Um, and I remember specifically your dinosaur skull and I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing. Um, but I ended up buying the little rat bones from you. And you were telling me how like you, you know, weed them out of like the owl pellets. And I was like, this is like 
this is another level of miniature making. Yeah. So that, that honestly, that, that show um, kind of like uh, put in perspective, like how I could do something different with, with my work. Um, yeah. And I feel like bringing, you know, there's always like that. And I've talked to you about this before, Darren, but like the bridge between like miniatures as a hobby and then right. miniatures is like a fine art and like elevated a little more, you know, in a gallery. Mm -hmm. um, so now that I'm putting my miniature work in galleries, it's really not something you see a lot in, especially in smaller galleries. Mm -hmm. I'm in Virginia right now and there's just me and Blake Gore. We're the only miniaturist in this area. And um, love Blake Gore, by the way. I he knows Blake you, Gore. Lauren. Okay, yes, he's uh, we've talked about it. Yeah, so great. when I first met him, I was like, Southern Gothic Dollhouse, he's like, I know her, like I made something for her. I was like, oh my God, this small world is truly small and connected. Um, so really it's only Blake Gore and I in this area. We're the only miniature artists, um, you know, and this is like, it's it's not super rural, but it's not, you know, yeah. on the East, East Coast near a big city or anything. So I think miniatures, I'm trying to get miniatures into places where maybe they're not typically found. And when I teach, um, you know, freshmen, I've been teaching at, at the university that I go to for a couple of years now, and I t try and teach, incorporate miniatures into, you know, 3D foundations because it's a great way for people to learn about scale. Um, you know, as both the Laurens were talking about, like theater, set design, um, it's just a great, you know, miniatures are is such a, it it's, can encompass so many different things and so many different areas of art. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of push that for the new generation, but also even people who have maybe been doing art for a long time who have never picked up a pair of tweezers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm always struck by seeing who uh, who's following who. And I'm also very interested in seeing how different their art forms are, but they are following each other. It's a, they're following each of you. You know what I mean? I think you just mentioned that, Amanda. And I, I see sometimes, oh, this person like that. And this person is doing a completely different thing in miniature. I love that that's what's bringing everybody get together. It's just awesome. Yeah. All right. So we have... You know, the uh, chat box is open if anybody has any questions for any of our panelists. But um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I will check the chat box if you guys have any questions. But um, I want to talk a little bit about how, um, you know, I have two questions, actually. Um, what? Well, I want to get to the last question next. But art versus versus craft you talk a little bit about that and what are those dividing lines and i honestly think it is it is about sometimes the stories that you tell because sometimes when it, 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 in the miniatures hobby it's about okay we made a beautiful chair and it's a beautiful chair that's great but you guys go to the next the next level with that chair and so what's what's your what's your overall feeling about art versus craft in in that sense um, how do you bring art to your craft? <laughs> I think it is it my turn? Yeah. <laughs> to uh, take yes. over and jump in. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I there, there are these questions in art that mm. are so tantalized, you know, like what is Southern Gothic? Like that genre, like what are the boundaries of it? Mm. What is art versus craft? And I think these questions are so exciting and like eternal and we're going back to them over and over again because they feel so impossible to like draw the line or to define. Right. Right. And I think, you know, as I've gone through with my own career and I, and I wonder, I'd be curious, you know, with Amanda and with Lauren, uh, like, that question of like, is this art? Is this valid? It's, mm. It hasn't really been at the front of my mind. There's this great, Andy Warhol has this really great quote that I'm totally gonna butcher, <laughs> but it's something to the effect of like, let everybody else worry about, you know, is it art? Is it craft? Is it worthwhile? Is, is your story worth telling? Do pe Should people be listening to it? Let other people sort that out and just keep making it. Like just get yeah. to work, you know? Yeah. And I love that. And I'm, I'm a huge fan also of folk art. Like I love, how folk art is another, it's like, a, you know, huge, broad, like, how do you define it? What's folk art? What's not? But I, I think two sort of aspects of it are self-taught. Like it's, you know, um, there's a self-taught element, you know, the incorporation of, um, of unconventional materials, you know, and it, it exists sort of outside this traditional 
um, credentialed art world where it's like you are an artist because I've given you the seal of approval or you know you're on this list or your piece is sold for this amount of money um, so I don't know I don't have really answers just to I hold think, <laughs> no I think I think you put it very well which is you know let other people worry about it it's it's not it's not you just do you <laughs> do you so yeah I see you, you're you're nodding <laughs> Lauren well, like yeah. especially if you're afraid to get started i would say like if you um, don't know how to jump into the yeah. genre and you feel intimidated you know everybody starts somewhere and it's it really is about progress and you learn and you acquire skills so don't you know don't be worried about I guess, yeah. jumping in with the hot all right hat. yeah agree i feel like there's a little bit of an obsession aspect of it at least for me where it's like I just have so many questions about something or like, I'm just, I'm just naturally curious about like a certain area, but I think like, you know, the art versus the skill, maybe like the message versus skill building instead of like the art versus the craft. Like there's so many skills that you can skill up in this arena. I mean, like you could really go deep into woodworking into ceramics into, I mean, electric, like there's a million painting, there's a million things. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, you're always trying to build those tool sets to be able to communicate what you want to communicate to people um, as effectively as possible. Like when Amanda was talking about, like I was a painter, but now like this is, I'm, I just wasn't my medium. I'm able to tell, like, t tell my truth um, a little bit more effectively through this medium. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. that it really, the art is like, I think probably the, 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 the purest part of yourself that you're trying to connect with people, you know, and convey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a couple of really great questions. Um, one, I'm going to take one here from Kate, which is if you weren't making miniatures, what would you be doing? That's a great question. <laughs> and I think, yeah, no, I mean, you're, you all have other things you're doing, but right. Like another hobby. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Well, let, let, what, what is that? If no, you were not doing making miniatures, <laughs> period. What else? Like maybe oh. maybe it's about time. Like, what? How else would you be spending mm. your time? Like, maybe that's a, the way to put it. Um, I'd probably still be in a studio and just painting instead, but non yeah. art related. I I figure skate, so maybe I just would skate more. <laughs> All right, so she that's clarified. Cool. Kate clarified. How would you get that creative brilliance out? So in other words, what else would you be doing to get that creative to that outlet? So something I, I really, really want to do is explore the South a lot more. Like I, I lived in Texas for a really long time, but, and I've like visited areas, but I'm not from like the deep South. Mm. Um, and I found like, I've been, I've been looking at, you know, areas that I would want to, to really get to know, understand, stay for several months at a time. So I feel almost like a charlatan and like telling stories of, of an area that I haven't like been for a really long time. And I think that um like steeping yourself in, yeah. in in an area that you're trying to tell the story of is a yeah. really good idea i found like an airbnb like floating apartment on like the bayou oh, i'm wow. like with like a little grill in the back i'm like that sounds like so much fun <laughs> like, absolutely so like just to kind of yeah. put around in the swamps of louisiana <laughs> would be really fun. That's what I'm saying. oh my gosh that was actually going to be my my other question which is um what what is next for you guys and 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 laura you really just answered that which is that's an idea that you have that you would like to explore um what what else is on your plate what else are you thinking because miniaturists always have a long list of things they want to tackle what about you lady d well, um, so first I'm gonna, Amanda and Lauren and I are going to get into a jalopy and we're going to cross the country, <laughs> staying in swamp boats and, you know, oh. looking for ghosts and mansions. I think we oh. got that figured out. Can we film yeah. that? I think that should be a reality series. Yeah, right if now. anybody knows any producers, that's, that's a travel show. To, <laughs> that you know, is a great movie. idea. <laughs> I would um, literally sign up for that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So oh, I, wow. I, so I'm excited. I um, last week started teasing. I've been doing this. This has been a two year collaboration with a local New Orleans architect where we 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 like he he used to be. Um, so he used to um, supply these really cool. They're called um, tunnel books. They're like they're dioramas that I used to sell in my brick and mortar shop. And so I met him that way. and. Um, developed this friendship and he you know was as everyone is was like interested in the miniature world and kind of fascinated by by the dollhouse world because it's kind of parallel to what he was doing and yeah. so somehow we hatched this idea to create a dollhouse kit um so literally for the you know the first step was he and i just walked up and down magazine street 
with a sketchbook and he's a he's a licensed architect so he knows houses more i know the ghosts in the house but he knows you know how they're actually put together in a way that i will never understand um but we you know did sketches and we took notes of sort of what we w envisioned for this kit and so um so we're gonna be selling we just um i'm gonna announce the pre-order when it goes live but it's this monster in the um, in the corner. So, and I, I mean, I'm going to be selling, selling it as a kit, but I'm also going to be filling oh. my own with um, stories. And oh, wow. Know. Wow. Are we yes. hearing that here first? Uh, I wish I could tell yes. you that. Well, actually, yeah. I mean, I shared it on social media, but yeah, this, oh, this is like right. the first, you know, the first news scoop. But well, we will did be you, following very closely. <laughs> you recently teased it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've been getting a ton of people messaging me like, did you see this? Did you oh, see this? Oh, that's so awesome. People are excited. People that's are really awesome. excited. Yeah. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank wow. You. Thanks. Yeah. Gosh. So Amanda, I know you're finishing up your MFA. You've got a lot on your plate for the next few weeks, but what, what can we <laughs> see coming along the pike for you? Um, yeah, I actually got accepted into two artist residencies. Um, so thank you. Um, I got accepted into Foundation House for a week in April and then Cray Garden, uh, which is in upstate New York in July for two weeks. So. I'm really excited to um, use the residencies to do something different with my work. Maybe just kind of, I'm a, I'm a very much like a type A artist. I plan a lot of things out. So I'm gonna try to kind of maybe do something a little more free flowing with, with miniature work instead. Maybe do some stop motion animation, which I've been playing around with. Oh. Um, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, well, that's amazing. Congratulations on yeah. all that to all of you on all of what's going on in your miniatures world. Why don't we take one final question? Um, oh goodness. Okay. Let's see. There's lots of great questions. How do you stay organized best on your multiple projects on time management? Do you enjoy juggling multiple things at once or, uh, or do you prefer to focus in on one specific thing? It sounds like one specific thing is your gig, Amanda, right? Does that sound right? You're a planner. <laughs> I, I I do have always multiple things happening at once though. I'm always working on like, I have like a shelf and I just have like three projects that I'm currently working on. So it's like, it is kind of like both. Yeah. Uh, I can hyper fixate on one, but I like yeah. to have a lot of things going on. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Lady D? Oh gosh, if you're asking Lady D about her organizational skills, you have taken a turn. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like controlled chaos, I would say. Like they're always, you know, a bunch of different things going on in various stages. I use, I mean, to be really like, to get down into the nitty gritty, this as I don't know how exciting this is, but I use Asana for daily task management. And then I also have a, like a, like an evolving Google document that I, oh. I kind of do self-evaluations and I check in with myself and I kind of set a, a goal, like a theme for the year. Wow. <laughs> do I, I don't I'm taking like, notes as we speak. I use wow. Asana for like when I, when I like that's, that's so personal. That's really impressive, Laura. What, what is that called again? Asana? Help Asana. me. It's like, it's a project management tool. It's, it's it has some of my favorite like UI. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, it's great. Yeah. And you can set Asana. goals for yourself. You can keep yourself, you can track your, your progress on things. You can like make subtasks for larger tasks and mess them. Yeah. It's really wow. cool. Oh, that's awesome. That's a big learning. Sana, I'm, I'm on it. So, all right. So everybody's working on multiple projects at any given time. It's pretty amazing. As, uh, all right, let's take one last question. Um, okay. Good question from Brianna. What technologies do you utilize in miniatures? Uh, I guess that, that that's my wife that asked that question. <laughs> I just saw that. <laughs> um, it's uh, a good question. Yeah, just, yeah it's great. Um, I don't know how much uh, Lady Delaney uses 3D printing, but I know Lauren uses 3D printing as well. Um, I use a lot of 3D printing in my work. Um, I, you know, I love using new technologies. I actually just got a laser cutter, so I'm really oh. excited to start using that. Um, but I feel like, you know, a lot of... And I just out of curiosity, what, what is oh, I got the I got the X tool. You like yeah, it? I got X tool. Uh, I haven't plugged it in yet because they forgot to send me the little smoke pur purifier and I'm in an apartment. So uh, I can't run it yet. <laughs> I can't really vent it out the window right now. But um, but I honestly, I love incorporating technology into, into miniatures. Not only does it, you know, the scale, if you have to have something really particular in mind that you want 
it to look like the object, like realism. Um, but also just like, I, you know, I think it just takes miniatures to the next level, especially if you are going for that realism. But I, I've taught 3D printing for miniatures at, uh, miniaturists at Philadelphia Miniatura for a few years. And I think the one thing that a lot of people who come through my class, they're kind of scared of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're kind of a little afraid. Um, and I'm just going to tell everyone in the audience, don't be afraid of 3D don't printing. Don't be afraid of laser cutting. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's definitely like a whole nother hobby. So get ready for that. Um, nice. But honestly, I love I love incorporating it. For me, it's just another tool, you know, just like my my exacto knife, just like my tweezers. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. Lauren wants to talk about 3D printing too because I know she does some. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And I check in with my supporters all the time about this, where it's like, because I'm making like, I, I'm making these little church signs right now and I'm oh. cutting everything by hand and it's, it's taking me a really long time. And I was like, oh, if I had like a laser cutter, maybe this would. And I was like, if it's hand, if it's hand hewn versus laser cutter, like, does it make it less special? I think, which is like the big debate or question. Right. And I think in some cases, like maybe, but there are, there, there, there are things that don't necessarily need to be hand hewn or special or like, you know, it, it's, I think it's about like getting the point across and how can you get there efficiently to a degree that's like, what is the goal of what you're trying to do and what, what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah. And if it really is like a matter of like, well, my goal is to make this pot like exactly like they did, like, um, like in Imperial Japan and I've studied it and like, we're going to make it just tiny. Yes. Like, absolutely. But if you're going to make like a bunch of stuff, no, I think that Technology is great. So I have um, two types of 3D printers. I have a resin wow. printer and I have a filament printer. I prefer the resin printer because it gets very good detail. Mm. Um, I What I do recommend though, our miniature power tools have been life-saving for me. So Micromark, um, they, they do not, I do not sponsor me, but they might as well. I love Micromark. So like you have like little um, like jigsaws, tiny jigsaws. Like if you feel like you don't want to use your X-Acto knife, like, really tiny jigsaws, tiny drills, tiny like sander belts. Like it's it's really incredible. So yeah, can't have enough tools. All right, how about you, Lady Delaney? Favorite? I know you work a lot in paper early on. That yeah. was your, yeah, paper. Yeah. yeah, I love sculpting paper. And I love, um, I loved what Lauren was saying earlier, um, kind of getting at this idea of, you know, to sharpen your storytelling skills, sharpening your technical skills. I'm not doing it justice but i thought that was um i thought that was really interesting you know you gotta have sharp tools if you want to tell the best story and what i find um and, and this is this something that has gone into that you know evolving self-evaluation document is that when i take on a new tool 